On the eastern side of the Mediterranean is the country of Israel, an area that's been populated by humans for at least 100,000 years. In northern Israel, specifically an area known as the Bet Shan Valley, is the archaeological site of Tel Rehov. In Hebrew and Arabic, a tel is translated loosely as mound, but this is no ordinary mound. Tel Rehov is the largest Canaanite and Israelite site in this valley, occupied for at least 2,500 years. Because of limited water and arable land, people in this area tended to occupy sites for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. So over the centuries, the inhabitants of Rehov repeatedly built new structures of the remains of earlier ones. This type of site formation is known as depositional formation. By the time it was abandoned, Tel Rehov covered 26 acres and was tall as a 38-story building. Tel Rehov is excavated about every two years. In the time between excavations, plants and animals can impact the site through a process known as bioturbation. Plant roots can loosen and damage fragile walls, while animals such as porcupines and birds often burrow deep into them, making them susceptible to collapse. One of the first things we do when we reopen the site is clean up all the weeds, such as you see here. That's why I always like to come after the first week of the dig and avoid all this kind of crap work. The holes you see in the mud brick walls are good examples of the damage these animals do. You have to be very careful when you're working near them because you never know what will jump out at you. According to the law of superposition, the deeper one excavates, the older the remains will be. On Tel Rehov, the deepest layers of excavations date back to about 1500 BC, while the top layers date to the Islamic period, about a thousand years ago. The levels revealed through archaeological excavation are known as strata, and the study of strata is known as stratigraphy. Temperatures in the Betshan Valley can exceed 100 degrees in the summer, so we start early to take advantage of the coolest part of the day. We are typically at the site by 5.15 a.m. and knock off about 12.30. Being up so early means that we get to see some spectacular sunrises. We are really fortunate to have a shake cloth over the entire site, but we do have to put it up and take it down every day. As you can see here, the poles aren't the most secure, and when the afternoon winds pick up, they tend to fall over, uh, oftentimes on one of the volunteers. And you can see our very strong girls here. <laughs> when you think of archaeologists excavating, you probably imagine trowels and tiny paintbrushes. In actuality, we use a variety of tools, from big to small. So as you see here, archaeology can at times be really backbreaking work. Archaeologists use a lot of different tools, so I've got an array of tools for you here. And we've got them right in the corner of our square. So when we're coming down on topsoil, for example, we're going to use this huge pickaxe. And yeah, we do sometimes use big tools. And then we've got our chiria. That's what it's called here in the Middle East, but it's basically a hoe. And then the little yellow handled object, that's a patiche, a little tiny pickaxe. And then we have dust pans, which are great for helping us remove the dirt. We have a, a large kind of mason's trowel, also very good for removing dirt. And then our finer tools, of course, we've got our trowel, a little fine patiche there, a brush, and of course, buckets. Lots and lots of buckets. We will move hundreds of buckets of dirt a day. And we'll also have buckets full of pottery and other artifacts that I'll show you. And because we're in topsoil, we can use our big hand picks. Excavations are not random. The entire site is laid out on a grid system. Each unit or square of this grid is on average, at least at Tel Rehov, about three by three meters in size. When we open a new square, we set up our grid lines with string. Each square is separated from the square next to it by a one meter wide artificial wall of dirt that is known as a balk. This allows us to access the inner squares. However, as architecture is revealed, we may take the balks down to follow the architecture if we have, for example, a wall that's connecting to a wall in another what square. We find a variety of things in an excavation. One class of items are called artifacts. And what is Joe? Artifacts are anything man-made or man-modified. Here in the Middle East, pottery is the most abundant of the artifacts we find. Another class of items are known as echofacts. Echofacts are simply unmodified natural items, such as uh, rocks, sand, seeds, uh, animal bones. 
botanical echofacts are specifically okay. known as flora, and they are often collected for further analysis. So, for example, here in this picture, you see an Israeli student collecting seeds that he has found in his square. Analysis of the seeds by specialists can tell us much about the local flora and the diet of the people at Rehov. We also uncover features. Features are any objects that cannot be removed without destroying them. So a wall, a burial, or a taboon, which is the uh, Middle Eastern word for oven, those are features. Archaeology, unfortunately, is a destructive science. To get to the next level, we must go through the one preceding it. Because we only have one chance to analyze what we find, it is imperative that we record everything. As we excavate, our job is to follow the stratigraphy. Imagine it as if you were peeling back the layers of an onion. Now, archaeologists often use the term in situ to describe where an object was found. And in situ basically means the last place that it was naturally deposited. So, in the markets in Jerusalem is not finding an artifact in situ. When you un uncover it, and last time it was seen was a thousand years ago, that's in situ. Finding an artifact in situ allows us to record its provenience. The provenience is simply its both vertical and horizontal location in the archaeological record. Horizontal measurements are recorded on a top plan. Now remember, we have already set up our squares in accordance uh, with longitude and latitude. So now all we really have to do is draw the architecture and any objects we want to record right on the top plan. It's just based on those original measurements. This is the top plan of a section of area C. But in order to record an object's vertical measurement, how deep in the ground it is, we take its, what's called a level, using basically surveyor's tool, a transit and a stick, just like the guys you see out taking levels you know, when you drive by them on the road. So once the object is removed then, we will have a record of its exact location in the archeological record. Now sometimes we have to improvise. In order to take the level in this very deep area, we needed the tallest guy. This is an Israeli student, his name is Itai. He had to actually hold up the tent with a pole. Now tell me that that is not job security. It is important that our balls be exactly 90 degrees to the Earth's surface, or what we call plumb. If we undercut them, we won't run the risk of them collapsing. If we overcut them, we cannot get a true picture of the stratigraphy. So again, it is very important that they are exactly 90 degrees. Now it may look easy to you, but trust me, it takes a lot of skill to get these damn things straight. One of the most important aspects of excavation is making sure that your sides, remember our balks, are 90 degrees, a good 90 degree angle. So what I'm doing right here is trimming my bulk. So I'm going to go back and the way I can tell if it's level or not is I have my plumb bob and I'm going to hold that against my string and anywhere that it's hitting the side of the wall I know that I have bowed out too much and so I'm going to have to cut back. So you can see that I've got some areas here where it's hitting so with my patiche I'll just keep trimming back until this whole thing is nice and level. To the west. Another important recording method is photography. We photograph important artifacts, uh, echo facts, features, whatever, as they are uncovered. But we also periodically photograph the entire site to document or record the progress. We try to shoot in the early morning light before the sun will create these really harsh shadows across the walls and the pits, and this could obscure important details. The photographer here is Ami Mazar. He's the dig director, a professor from Hebrew University. And uh, just as an FYI, he actually has yet to fall off that ladder, although he's come close several times.